brother's sitting in on us here now. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 this morning. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Father, I need wisdom now. Lord, I need the gift of teaching. And our Father, I pray you'd give the folks in here ears to hear and a heart receptive to your word. In thy name I pray. Amen. You have two epistles to Timothy, First and Second Timothy, written by the Apostle Paul. And uh, this uh, being therefore written to an individual. You look at First Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 3. First Timothy 1, 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went to Macedonia, thou mightest charge some they teach no other doctrine. The Apostle Paul uh, enjoined uh, Timothy to abide at Ephesus. Eusebius tells us that Timothy was the first bishop of Ephesus. Therefore, he's a bishop, a preacher, minister of the Word of God, of the church at Ephesus. And uh, if that be true, and Eusebius, of course, is a early church historian. He's relied upon greatly for what happens in the first uh, two or three hundred years after Christ. If that be true, and I'm not saying it is true because Eusebius is not Scripture, but uh, his, his record may be accurate, then the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Ephesians, which we have here, obviously is written to the church that Timothy was pastoring. Timothy, of course, is, the Apostle Paul said, his own precious son in the faith. So Timothy uh, came up very well. If you look at verse number 5, chapter 1 of Second Timothy, chapter 1, verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I also persuaded in thee. Now, it's important to understand that the faith that Timothy is being uh, applauded for is the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had no problem embracing the Lord Jesus Christ. That needs to be understood. That's a very important thing, that to be an Old Testament Jew that believed in the promises of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there was nothing in that whatsoever that would dispose someone to reject Christ. The Pharisees rejected Christ based on a lot of different things that had nothing to do with the Bible. That's important, very important. The basis, of course, for the Pharisees reject Christ and the religious leaders of his day was their standing in Rome. That was the first thing. They said plainly in the Bible that they'll come and take away our nation. So they wanted to charge him with sedition. The Roman emperor didn't care who you worshipped. You could worship snakes yourself or whatever. You didn't make any difference to him as long as you recognized his place as a sovereign God and his uh, college of vestal virgins. Therefore, if you recognize the Roman emperor as a god, then you could worship whatever you pleased. So the Pharisees rejected Christ not based on the Bible. And a Jew does not reject Christ to this very day based on the Bible. It's based on the Talmud. Right. And the Talmud, of course, is a product of evolution. The Talmud evolved over centuries. 2,000 years ago, the Talmud was not in written form. It was in verbal form. And it's what the Lord referred to when He said, You've made the Word of God of none effect by your traditions. The Talmud had its origins when Israel was in Babylon. Therefore, the Talmud has a direct connection with all the Babylonian religions. It has a connection with idolatry. It has a connection with, with uh, pagan demonism, the understanding of demons. It has, a pagan, it has a connection with all pagan superstition. The Babylonian Talmud is one of the most pagan, superstitious books on the face of the earth. And so when you deal with a Jew today and he quotes the Talmud, and using that as a source to reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to look at him and smile and say, surely you got something better than that. Because the Talmud, when it falls under scrutiny, is one of the worst things ever written on the face of the earth. It's not the Bible, folks. The Talmud is not the Bible. So the Apostle Paul said, Timothy, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise to salvation. He's talking about Genesis through Malachi, 
or as it is the order in the, in the Hebrew Bible, Genesis through Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles is the last book in the Hebrew Bible. They have the same books we have, but some of their books are combined, like First and Second Kings and so forth. But they have all that we have. We have everything they have. Our Bible ends in Malachi. They have Malachi in a different order than us. I hope you follow me there. Second Chronicles is the last book in the Hebrew Bible. So therefore, if a Jew only reads the Old Testament, he has no problem accepting Christ. This is why the apostle said, Timothy, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, able to make thee wise to salvation. When Simeon held up the Lord Jesus Christ in his hands, he said, Mine eyes hath seen thy salvation. Amen. Now thy servant can depart in peace. Amen. Salvation is not a doctrine. No. Salvation is not a catechism. Right. Salvation is not your church. It's not your priest, your preacher. Salvation is a person. Right. A person. And Simeon, wise as he was, had no problem accepting an infant that he held in his hands as his Savior before he ever went to the cross, before the, before the, uh, the atonement was ever made, Simeon accepted him as his Savior. And so did Anna, a prophetess that stayed in the temple night and day and uh, prayed to God and worshiped God. So it's important to understand that the New Testament writers are not rebels. They're not rebelling against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. They're rebelling against the religion of the Jews. Right. And the Apostle Paul said, I profited in the Jews' religion above all, mine equal, my peers. He said, I profited in it, in the Jews' religion. But he made a clear distinction between the Jews' religion and the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So to Timothy, the first bishop of the church at Ephesus, he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, God called Paul. Man did not call him. God called him, set him aside, ordained him, and uh, put him in the ministry. The apostle said he, he counted me worthy putting me into the ministry. And, uh, you know, I think it's always best like that if you want to know the truth about it. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to think of his name right now, but he came to this country in the 1700s, an Englishman, and he preached uh, during the Great Awakening. And uh, what is his name? He, he, he was a contemporary of... Uh, of, uh, of Wesley, Whitfield, George Whitfield, thank you, Whitfield. When, when Whitfield first announced his calling to preach, nobody ordained him. Nobody wanted to ordain him because he didn't, uh, he didn't apparently didn't uh, qualify for their church. So nobody wanted to ordain him. But then after they saw the thousands upon thousands upon thousands, I read one story where it said that uh, you could see the smoke in the roads, the dust in the roads as they were driving their, their horses to get to a meeting where Whitfield was preaching. It was obvious that God's hand was upon him. So here, here shows up the religious authority and said, Brother Whitfield, we'd like to ordain you. <laughs> By ordaining him, of course, they associated themselves with him. He said, no, thank you. <laughs> His ordaining, ordination came from above. Amen. It usually works better like that Amen. because he, know, he knows he knew, he, knew, he knew where he came from. And so it was with the Apostle Paul. He was accepted by the brethren in Jerusalem when Barnabas went with him. If you'll remember, he went, Barnabas went with him down to Jerusalem. And they respected Barnabas and they accepted Barnabas. And uh, so Barnabas gave his approval of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, gave his approval of him. And they tentatively accepted him. But they still had a bunch down there that didn't uh, that eyed him. They, he wasn't accepted readily, quickly, and easily. But, uh, but obviously, by writing the biggest majority of the New Testament, it's obvious who God called. Is it? And uh, they're long since forgotten. But the Apostle Paul, his message is preached every day. That shows the, or the origin and authority of it. But he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, with the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. All right. The promise of life has to do with this. Go back to the book of Romans, chapter number 8. And you'll find two laws. Romans 8, verse 1. Here are two laws. These two laws butt heads. They cannot complement each other. They have nothing to do with each other. <coughs> there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now watch verse 2. We have two laws. For the law of the Spirit of life 
in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, on the surface of it, you'd think he's talking about the law of God, the Ten Commandments, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the law that is working in Romans chapter number 7. Sin and death is a law. If you commit sin, death is working in your members. It is, it is an inevitable law, an immutable law, and it will come to pass exactly as the lawgiver has said that it will. He that sinneth shall die. The soul that sinneth shall die. So the law is a law that says sin brings forth death. The only way that you can escape the condemnation of the law and sin and death is by a greater law. That's the only way. A greater law. The greater law, in verse number 2, is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is a greater law than the law of sin and death. In plain words, it trumps it. It has more power. It can overcome it. And notice, there is nothing else, no man's ability, nothing, that can trump the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is inevitable. It will bring forth death. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And nothing can stop that but a greater law. And so when I got saved by the grace of God, sin and death were working in my members, and I was condemned under the law of sin and death. I couldn't do one thing to change the law of sin and death. But when the law of life in Christ Jesus Amen. came into my soul, it trumped it. It was greater than. It nullified it. It put it to death. Amen. And so when the apostle says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, he says, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus... The reason the promise was of life in Christ Jesus is because life could never be promised through the law. The law could never give anyone life. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. He has served from his forefathers. Notice carefully. Go to verse 5. When I called remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. Verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. What is faith? You can't define it. You either have it or you don't. He gives you definitions here that are biblical. We understand what by if we have true faith, we embrace these things, but faith is a spiritual thing that you either have or you don't have. The Jewish religion, therefore, when I say Jewish religion, let me take that back. The faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the only true faith on the face of this earth. To have faith in something or someone who cannot respond. As he said to them in the Old Testament, you carve out a stone or a, a tree and you worship it. It can't hear you. It can't see you. It can't speak to you. It can't respond. How foolish you are. But the Old Testament prophets prayed to the God that could not be seen, an invisible being. In 1 Timothy 6.15, if you'd like to turn over there and read that, you'll see what he's talking about. Dwelling in the light which no man can see, which no man hath seen. Nothing changed. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is described for you in 1 Timothy 6.15. Read that. 16. 1 Timothy 6.16. 15 leads into it. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, read that, and you'll see what the Bible says about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, you can't see him. No man hath seen him. No man's ever seen him, yet you believe in him. Right? The apostle says in 1 Peter, whom having not seen, you believe. You haven't seen him. When somebody comes up and tells you they've seen the Lord, you know, kind of, I'm a little bit. They say, what you been eating? <laughs> 
you might see a manifestation where God condescends to your abilities as a human being, which are very limited. As a human being living in this body, we can only comprehend so much. How many of you this morning would, would, would uh, agree with me that there's a whole lot more going on around you that you're conscious of? Good. We got to square one. That helps. There's a whole lot more going on around us right now than we are conscious of. And if we took every piece of, 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 uh, of diagnostic equipment and high-tech stuff and this and that could measure everything that we know exists and measure all of it, and you could see it all on some kind of a screen or see it on a printout or something, you still wouldn't begin to even touch what's going on around you. So the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is an invisible being. He's pure light, and he dwells in light. No man has ever seen him. The only thing they have ever seen is a manifestation where he condescends to our level and allows us to comprehend with our limited resources what he wants us to see. You know what I mean? Amen. That's it. And if a man thinks that he has the ability to find God, search out, he's arrogant. That's the height of arrogance and the depth of ignorance. For a little mere human being, a creature of dust and time, to think that he could search out this eternal being and then comprehend him once he saw him is foolishness. So this is why the Bible promises us we shall see him as he is. We don't even know yet what we're going to appear to be. But we know that when he comes, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Our understanding of God is progressive. God's revelation to man is progressive. We start in the cellar, start in pure ignorance and darkness, and God gradually raises us up to a higher level to where one day we will be able to comprehend, and it won't be with this mortal flesh. It won't be with these two eyes. It won't be with that brain that you think with now. You'll be in a much higher state of being than you are now. The spirit made free. The Bible said in the book of Hebrews, the spirits of just men made perfect. That spiritual perfection is what God intends for all of us. So the apostle says, by faith we understand that the worlds were not framed. The worlds were framed by the Word of God. Things that are seen are not made by things that do appear. We understand that the invisible God, spirit being, that we can't even define. Nobody can tell you what a spirit is. They can't tell you what a spirit is. I was reading the other day where Darwin said uh, back in the 1800s, when he came out with his thesis of the origin of the species, Darwin made this statement when he talked about all this evolutionary process that goes on, process of natural selection, so forth and so on. He said, still, though, here's what he said. We still cannot determine the origin of life. That's quite a thing. That showed he had a little sense. That was the greatest statement Darwin ever made. Not where he observed mutations and, and so-called evolution. The greatest statement Darwin ever made was when he said, we cannot discern the origin of life. Amen. Mr. Darwin, let me tell you what it is. From the Bible, we understand that things which appear do not, or were not made by things which do appear. Amen. In plainer words, God Almighty. Amen. Define him, preacher. I can't describe him. Only, I can only describe him as he makes himself known. And so by faith we understand that. Do I believe it? Absolutely. Do I understand all of it? Absolutely not. But by faith I believe it. Amen. I, be amen. I believe it. And so when we come back to Timothy, we come back to him and the Apostle Paul begins to talk to him about the faith. Now notice, please, and this is where it becomes a, this is where it becomes a, a racial thing. Racial in the sense of, uh, of revelation. What group of people did God reveal himself to for mankind to know? The Jew. Not Americans. Not Europeans. Not the educated or uneducated. The Jew. To him was given the oracles of God. You want to know why the Jews are hated? That's the reason. And someone would come to me and they say, Well, now, preacher, good night. Everybody else, all these, everybody's got a concept of God. And hear what kind of concept they have. They have a pagan, ignorant concept, and for the most part, their gods are demons. 
Sure they do. The reason they do, they've got a motive. That's true. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a mystery. And he's still a mystery. Think of it like this. And this is as far as I've got with it, but it just keeps burning in my soul. That pure light that is invisible, yet it's pure light, that dwells within light, that where it is to be found, nobody knows. But he's out there. And then all of a sudden, busting forth from that pure light, comes a ray shooting out toward creation. That ray that shoots out of that pure light manifests itself as a man. 2,000 years ago, God manifested himself as a man. That man that was, manifest, was a manifestation of that pure light reflected that light and was glorified with the light that he came from. And this is why he said we beheld his glory. And this is why it says in Hebrews chapter number 1, who the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can't see him physically, and I haven't seen Christ physically. No one ever has ever, you know, no one painted him. And I brought this up to you time and again. You take, him, you take Michelangelo, for example, over there in the Sistine Chapel. He was a magnificent artist. No question about that. Forget his religion. He was a magnificent artist. You take Leonardo da Vinci. You take uh, Caravaggio. You take some of these guys. They were wonderful artists. They could capture, they could capture F, Samuel F.B. Morse. How many of you know Samuel F.B. Morse? How many were you taught, taught that in school? He's the one who invented the Morse code. He was one of the fathers of, of technology in our country. He fit in the same category as, as Alexander Graham Bell and uh, so forth. Samuel F.B. Morse, when I was in Charlotte, in Charleston, South Carolina one time, I went into an old mansion, and they were pointing beautiful portraits on the wall, beautiful portraits. And I noticed at the bottom it said, Samuel F.B. Morse. I said, is this the same one who invented the telegraph? Yes. He was an artist. He could capture the likeness of an individual. That's a wonderful ability. Yet 2,000 years ago, not one single person, not one, not one single person ever captured the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. What you find the first two or three hundred years after Christ are what's called iconic. In plain words, they, have a, they, 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 they create what's supposed to be the, the features of a human being as they want you to see them, and then ever, all the rest of them look that way. It's called iconography. And the Lord Jesus Christ, nobody painted him. Nobody carved him. Nobody ever did any of that. And I think there's a reason for that. There's a reason for it. They'd be bound down and worshiping it. They sure would. And when you worship anything, a devil can possess that thing. That's right. Anything you worship, a devil can possess it. And then what happens? You're worshiping a devil. So he is uh, uh, the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob given to the Jew. And still is because God's not done with the Jew. And it'll be the Jew, it'll be through the Jew in the tribulation period that the Son of Man reveals himself to the earth because it'll be 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel that preaches in the, in the seven-year tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble. They'll be preaching. And so God, once again, will come back to the Jew to reveal himself and manifest himself to the Gentiles. Look at verse number three. I was sought thee to abide it. Uh, let's get over here to the right book. Second <laughs> uh, Timothy one. Verse three. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Watch this. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. Timothy was praying for the Apostle Paul's joy. Apparently he had lost some of his joy and he was praying for his joy to come back. Now folks, your joy is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And Paul hadn't lost his faith, but something had zapped him of his joy. And uh, the joy, of course, is not, uh, is not happiness. 
That's not happiness. Happiness comes from the old English word hap, which means your circumstance, whatever's going on around you. Joy is a supernatural gift of God. It's the ability to look into a situation that you don't like, you don't want, and still have the power of God working in your life, and you rejoice because of the one who's in control of every aspect of your life. That's joy. You rejoice. You're rejoicing in Him. So he said that your joy may be filled. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, of course, unfeigned means genuine, real, that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. So all he's going to do is nurture that faith. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, this is a transmission of gifts. A transmission of gifts, therefore, has to do with unction. It has to do with the ability to lay hands on and the gift is given to the individual. I said, you believe in that preacher? Absolutely, I believe in it. I certainly do believe in it. And that's why the Bible admonition is to lay hands suddenly on no man. That laying hands on means that you are in agreement with this person. You have accepted this person. You believe that their faith is genuine and real. And you want the power of God to anoint them. God is the giver of gifts, folks. The gift is necessary to do the work of the Lord. If you don't do it by the gift of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, you're doing it by the arm of the flesh. And the arm of the flesh will always want to be praised and recognized for what it does. And the arm of the flesh will never be able to accomplish the work of the Lord. The arm of the flesh can masquerade as the gift of God. I've watched it, seen it, observed it. I've seen it in my own life. When you try to do something to glorify God and the gift of God is not working in your life, you will get frustrated, you will get worn out, burned out, tired. And the reason for that is because you are trying to do it. This is why the scripture says the servant of the Lord must not strive. You don't have to force it. You don't have to make anything happen for God. All you have to do is to be obedient. Be, a fa be, be available and faithful. A servant of the Lord to be faithful. It's required of a steward to be faithful. That's all. Not successful. The gift is the supernatural working of the Spirit of God in a human being. The gifts are listed over there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Uh, there it lists nine gifts of the Spirit. But I think that's a general categorization because nine gifts, that's all fine but it could be manifested in thousands of different ways when the ministry, where it's being ministered. So he said he laid hands on you, he laid hands on Timothy, and a transmission of a gift was given to him, just like when the Lord Jesus Christ breathed on them in John 20 and said, Receive ye the gift of the Holy Spirit. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This was a commissioning. It was a sending forth with unction and power and authority. And then, of course, what follows? He told them what they could do. Whosoever sins you remit, they should be remitted to them. Whosoever sins you retain, they should be retained. The Roman Catholic Church goes straight to that scripture. They go straight to that. And they take that as a, as a, as a mandate for them to be able to forgive men of their sins or retain their sins. And that's one of the basis or one of the pillars of their priesthood. They build their priesthood, the Roman Catholic priesthood, on the idea that they are a selected group set aside with the ability to retain or forgive sins and they hold that over the head of the people. The idea is, of course, they take it, they take it, of course, to mean they are the ones who are the apostolic successors to the gift in the, in the book of John, chapter number 20. When he breathed on them and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost, that's for all of us. If we're a true believer... I believe firmly when the Apostle Peter says we are a royal priesthood, I believe that's talking about every single believer in the Lord Jesus. That's right. Every one of us. It's not easy to explain what he's talking about when he says, whosoever sins you retain, they shall be retained, or whosoever sins you remit, they shall be remitted. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 
he said back in Matthew. So when you look at Scripture like that, you say, well, how are we to understand that? You can get commentaries and read until you're blue in the face. And you'll get every kind of, uh, of uh, uh, explanation in the world. I can give you one illustration, and it makes a lot of sense to me. When the Apostle Paul was talking about Alexander the coppersmith, he said, he hath done me much wrong. He hath done me much evil. Didn't he? Paul said, God reward him accordingly. That's strong. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, one that had his father's wife, he said, Paul being absent from them, not with them, present, he said, turn him over to Satan. Didn't he? That's a direct intervention in the man's life. And other places in the Bible, it's uh, intercessory prayer on behalf of someone by a Christian is a powerful thing. But when God won't let you pray for somebody, it's because God's intervened. And he's done me like that a number of times. Don't want to hear it again, so I don't bother him again. I don't force the issue. If he won't let me pray, I don't, that's not my call. That's God's call. And I back off and leave it alone. And uh, that falls into that category. But as far as a, as a, as a uh, Nicolo Nicolaitan priesthood, like the Roman Catholic Church, where they have auricular confession, they have a booth. Right. You go into the booth, the, and there's a, usually some kind of a, a, a dividing there, a, a curtain or a window of some kind. The priest sits on one side, you sit on the other side, and you confess your sins to him, you see. Then he absolves you of your sins. You, he pronounces some words over you. And then he tells you to do penance. Say so many Hail Marys and you know, Our Fathers and what have you. Yeah. He told you to do a hundred one time. See, this brother was raised as a Roman Catholic. And he's talking about when he was five years old going into the booth and confessing to the priest. Never, liked it. Never did like it. I, I knew it was wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I've been in there. I've seen their station. Yeah. You all hear this now? That's an outstanding testimony. Well, you know why they did that? It says in the book of Galatians, they've born after the flesh, persecute the one born after the spirit. Ishmael persecuted Isaac. No, you couldn't pick on him because he had something. He was preaching to you. Sure he was. He showed you a reality. He showed you a reality that's much greater than religion. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Amen. And so uh, the ones that did all the preaching ran off with somebody's wife. Is And he was a big preacher. Oh, okay. Right. I wish everybody could hear that, don't you? Hear that, hear that testimony? 
That's what led him to the Lord, Amen. the man's life. Good. Amen. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that's because of the the spirit. That's right. You can't drive people to know the Lord. You can't you can't beat that into them. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Oh well, yeah. 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 So how do you counter that? You counter it with the truth. You know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's the only thing to break the bondage is truth. And uh, you saw the grace of God working in a life, in the life of a man, the grace of God. You saw it, and that drew you. That grace drew you. That drew you. And so uh, that's, uh, that reinforces the Scripture, of course, the Word of God. All right, so uh, unfeigned faith. And stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So the Bible said when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended, he that led captivity captive, led captivity captive, right? Yeah. Talking about the Lord Jesus. Now what's that mean? He led captivity captive. Okay. Well, it says right before that, he, first, did he descend into the hearts of the earth? All right. Okay. He first descended into the heart of the earth. Then he led captivity captive. And then what did he do? He gave gifts to men. All right. The, the, uh, the authority to give the gifts was vested in Christ Jesus based on his finished work when he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Okay? All of this is in successive stages. He had to qualify to be qualified to do it. He breathed on them and gave them the same spirit he had when he was in this world. Breathed on them. Then when he ascended to the right hand of the Father, by the authority vested in him, he gave gifts to men. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the gift giver. And the gift giver, of course, comes by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. There's no gift. There's no gift in the work of God without the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit has to be present. There's no gift. If the Holy Spirit is not working in a congregation of people, you may have beautiful singing. You've got performance. You, you may have all kinds of uh, things being uh, manifested. In the, and you have talent and ability and performances. And I'm afraid that that's what the churches have descended into today. But I had rather hear. I had mother. I had rather, ten thousand times. I had rather hear some poor soul, Amen. some poor soul that is unknown by anyone except heaven, singing from the heart, Amen. the grace of God. Amen. I'd rather hear that any day of the week, Amen. any day of the week, than a trained professional. Right. If I want to listen to a trained professional, all I got to do is turn the radio on, right. go to some theater somewhere. I can watch professionals all day long, but a worship service is not a, is not a production by professionals. Amen. A worship service is a place where God's people come together born again, and they glorify God that saved them and, and brought them up out of hell and changed their life. Well, I won't go any further today. I'll pick that up again next week. And I want to thank you for what you added to this lesson this morning because, because I've never heard that before. You know, I've never heard your testimony like that before. I still feel the sting from the Sister Bridget's pointer and wouldn't have stick. I'll give you a wrap on your hand like you would. You know. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. 
Well, they believe that you can have spiritual power by physical discipline. When you went through, they had the uh, aesthetic movement. They had pole sitters. You ever heard of a pole sitter? You go up on top of, what's his name, Simon something? That's what, Simon Stylites. He sat up on top of a pole. He got up on top of a pole. And people could see him a long way off. And the whole idea was that he is, he's, he's, he's manifesting his, his dedication to God and he's receiving power from God because he's on top of this pole. See, and he's denying all worldly pleasures and, and everything that has to do with the world. See, and so he's, he wants everybody to see it, obviously. <laughs> he's up on this pole. But what does it really do for you? What works righteousness in the heart of a believer, folks? What, who is made into us righteousness? The Lord Jesus Christ. Not, not a pole. Simon Stylites. All right. Brother Ruye, will you dismiss us, please?